My dear brothers and sisters and dear friends, it's a wonderful privilege that I have to be with you today and to share some thoughts about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on the Emerald Isle. I'm thankful for the privilege uh, that I have to be involved in the history of the Church and um, it's wonderful to see the development of the church on this island and I want to share some thoughts and feelings with you today that I hope will give you a greater appreciation for how the church has emerged and developed um, on on this island in the last nearly 200 years uh, since it first came here. So as you can see there um, on the screen I have a PowerPoint presentation and I hope that the insights I share will be useful and be accurate and be faith promoting and will be an accurate representation of what has happened and the great work that's happened on, on this island in the Lord's Church. So let me begin with my uh, first slide um, and this is I've, I've entitled this the promises made to the fathers and there is a sense in which the coming forth of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Ireland in these last days is a fulfillment of prophecy is a fulfillment um, of the promises of the Lord. I've entitled this, The Promises Made to the Fathers. I've noted that a man by the name of William Lee was born in Carrickfergus, um, Ireland, Northern Ireland, um, in 1745. It wasn't called Northern Ireland then, because that was before partition, but it was in the place called Carrickfergus. Um, one of his descendants would be Harold B. Lee, who was the 11th president of the church. So the, Ireland has contributed toward uh, the presidency of the church, just as have all the nations um, throughout the UK and Ireland in what people traditionally call the British Isles, England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland, or what we would now call Northern Ireland and, and Southern Ireland, or just Ireland. And so each of these countries has contributed to a president of the church. On our next slide, I want to talk for a moment about how the church has emerged and, and grown. Um, the church really has had several stages of development uh, on this Emerald Isle. The first runs from about 1840 to 1849. So that's the, the humble beginnings of the church um, and and of course the church commenced slowly um, and took many many years to really become established and in many ways we're still establishing the church um, so it's a developmental process um, and it, it obviously takes takes time and after uh, 1849 I suppose the next series of development is, is probably um, the next 100 years really um, where the church started to lay something of a foundation but really it was only from the 1960s onwards um, that the church really started to build a firm base here a base of support a base of early pioneers which would grow and which would develop into the church we have today. Um, and as you can see there, I've, I've entitled Little Steps, that's 1850 to 1900, but really I've said 50 years there, but it's really more like uh, 100 years. Um, so I've called it Little Steps because that's really what was being taken, small, small steps, baby steps in many ways. And then, of course, um, 1901 to 1960, the small progress 
progress of the church. So really that's 1840 to 1960 um, or longer, I would say. And that's really a process of gradual development of slow incremental progress in the work of the Lord. Um, and then of course I've titled the last portion uh, up to now as in gradual gradual development and progress so it's been a slow and steady progress incremental line upon line precept upon precept so really i suppose four stages of development but the first three prior to now and then and then now um, and so that's what we've seen happening let me move on to my next slide here so Let's talk about 1840 to 1849. So this was really the beginnings of the church on this island. We know that in 1840, Thomas Tate became the first Latter-day Saint on this island. Um, and this happened in a place called Loch Brickland, which we would now call Northern Ireland. It was just Ireland at the time. And essentially, John Taylor who was an apostle who would later become the third president of the church he was traveling through the countryside um, with his associates and this brother thomas tate was being taught and at a certain point thomas um, quoted the scripture from the new testament here is water uh, what doth hinder me from being baptized and of course john taylor uh, gratefully agreed that there was no hindrance and that Thomas needed to be baptized so they proceeded to go into Loch Brickland that beautiful lake and there he was he was baptized the first person to be baptized by priesthood authority in this new dispensation what a marvelous thing that restored priesthood authority which had been restored to the prophet Joseph Smith by those who held it anciently John the Baptist, as as who who held the the Aaronic priesthood, um, and was able to give Joseph Smith the authority to baptize, and of course later Peter, James, and John, who held the keys of the Melchizedek priesthood and the higher ordinances of the gospel. So here we have Thomas Tate, who heard the message of the restored gospel, and was baptized. Much of the teaching in the early days of the church centered around Belfast and that was where most of the success was it wasn't until much later that the church came to Dublin and other parts but this Loch Brickland is a very special place in many ways for the church in this island it represents the beginning of a new day the dawning of a new era the commencement of a new opportunity a new privilege a new privilege that members could join the church the people who believed in the teaching of the missionaries and the prophet joseph smith and in the book of mormon in this latter-day restoration could join the church could be baptized could be washed clean could be made new by covenants and ordinances which were applicable in our day revealed and restored priesthood power and authority how amazing that is that that privilege that people in Ireland could now be baptized by proper authority. Then between 1850 and 1900, I have a picture there of Dublin Main Street and O'Connell Street in around that time between 1850 and 1900. And again, the teaching of the church, the preaching of the gospel was slow. Um, it was slow in, in Dublin and there was slow progress and many setbacks um, but the church would find a way eventually it would find an opportunity and um, it would it would find that there were people who were receptive in in due course to the message of the restoration and i've indicated there about the the dublin branch being established originally when the church was established properly in dublin um, it was actually German pork butchers, the Mogherlis, um, that were the mainstay of the church. So it wasn't really people who were born in Ireland at that time. It was uh, those German saints, those pioneers of the land um, who accepted 
the charge to build the kingdom of God in Ireland. What a, what a marvelous thing that is. Let me move on to this realm of 1850 to 1900. Many people will be aware of the close connection between Ireland and England and in political and other terms, in geographical terms, in social terms, and there's a huge connectivity there. In fact, um, many people who were actually born in Ireland didn't accept the church here because um, they had actually emigrated to England or to Scotland or to Wales, and they accepted the restored gospel in those other places. We know, for example, that the liberal, Liverpool branch of the church um, actually teaches us that from 1840 to 1855, 9% of the people baptized reported their birth country as Ireland. So if you think about that, um, that's, that's the equivalent of 180 people um, in, that, in that time period. So it's a significant indicator that Irish people are receptive to the everlasting gospel. Uh, when the circumstances and the situations are are such that they can accept it. And so they did, many of those people who, who moved abroad to those places uh, accepted the gospel. And I've quoted something similar there on, on the sheet, the, um, on the PowerPoint there about how many of the people in Glasgow were of Irish ancestry who accepted the church, who embraced the restored gospel. So what a powerful indicator. We sometimes think that um, Irish people don't accept the gospel in Ireland. Um, and sometimes that's true, but many times it isn't true. And also many times they've accepted the gospel in other places. So this, there is a receptivity. The house of Israel is here in these islands, rich, a rich inheritance. And we know that the prophets have told us that there's a rich inheritance um, of the kingdom of God, the rich um consistency really of of uh, of the house of israel on these islands these two islands and so we can see that in the receptivity to the gospel message let me move on in the period 1850 to 1900 we have some interesting things happening we have a brother by the name of charles a callus who actually was born in dublin in ireland and at a later stage moved, emigrated, um, and became a part of the church. He actually be later became an apostle of the church of the Lord. And it's interesting that his birthplace was Ireland. And you can see on the PowerPoint that there's a commemorative um, site for him in Dublin. We have a marker marking his birthplace where he was born. Um, and to indicate that there is a receptivity to the restored gospel on this island. Uh, Elder Callas served as a mission president for some 25 years in America. He was a firm defender of the faith. He was true and loyal to his charge and to his covenants. And he did the work of the Lord in gathering many to the message of the Lord um, for such a long time. And missionaries from Ireland have gone from Ireland to serve in many places all over the world. I can think over the years for the time that I've been in the church, um, which is going on for 50 years now at this juncture. Um, in a couple of years, I'll be a member of the church for 50 years. So the, there are many in Ireland who have served in America, who have served in Europe, um, who have served even in Asia, and in other parts of the world, in Australia, um, in Africa, and have served as missionaries to bring others to the cause of Christ through uh, the teachings, through the power, through the authority of the restored gospel. So Charles A. Callas, Elder Charles A. Callas, was a man who was born in this land and shows us that there is a legacy of faith, there is a heritage of faith and faithfulness. And it's important to remember that many may not be aware of that, that a Latter-day Apostle uh, was born on this island. So I'm grateful to know that and be able to indicate that. Um, Elder Callas was married 
and he was the father of eight children and he was firm um, and faithful in the faith uh, to the end of his life let me move on then to the next slide in the period 1901 to 1960 so though many irish emigrants joined the church overseas the dublin branch was reorganized in 1901 with mostly German immigrant members, as I've said before. At the time of Irish independence in 1922, these families and other converts made up a faithful core of saints, trusting in the Lord to guide their, their hands. Um, they were a tiny minority in the gospel cause in the country compared to the number of people. But they were nevertheless a cohort, a core, and um, that could prepare the way for the church to come out of obscurity. Let me move on then to my next slide here. This is from 1960 to 1990. We see that the organization of the Irish mission in 1962 led to a period of rapid growth during which the first church built meeting house was completed in 1971 that's the Terenure Chapel in Dublin Ireland and I remember when we joined the church in 1976 at the end of 75 the early part of 1976 that we went to church in that chapel in Terenure um, and so the the church started to build a foundation in southern Ireland what we call Ireland but a lot of people refer to as southern Ireland and so in Dublin, which is really the central place, Dublin is, is on the coast, but it's really the middle point um, of the country between the north and the south. Dublin is the biggest city in Ireland. And then we have, of course, Belfast in Northern Ireland. And down in the south, we have Cork and Nimerick as two relatively big cities. So the church started to develop a presence in what we call the Republic of Ireland. Um, in the late 60s really um, and the early 70s and the manifestation of that was with the building of this beautiful Terenure chapel and um, the chapel was extended at a certain point after that so the picture now is, is bigger I think than it than the chapel was originally that's a beautiful building on the south side of the Dublin uh, city let me move on then um, 1960 to 1990 a lot of very impressive things happened during that time the bottom picture there is a picture taken from many years ago and two of the people in that are Bob and Maureen Lynn anyone who's familiar with the the church the history of the church in Ireland in the last um, 60 years would know about Bob and Maureen Lynn <clears throat> and they were stalwarts of the church um, in Ireland they've since emigrated um, to the United States but they were stalwarts and um, served incredibly for a long period of time in fact brother Lynn was the Dublin branch president for some 23 years and I remember uh, the Lynns when I was a child and I remember their faithfulness and loyalty and devotion in the church um, and their family and all the people they they helped to bless through their service up above in the top picture is a picture of several people being baptized one of those is Bernard O'Farrell uh, Bernard O'Farrell joined the church in 1969 as one of the first converts to the church really him and his family joined and he um, went on to have seven children brother O'Farrell served as a branch president as a district president on the mission presidency um, and then when the stake was organized he served on the high council and subsequently became a patriarch the first patriarch who was ordained who was born in Ireland in southern Ireland as far as we're aware who, who stayed in Ireland and um, in this dispensation so brother O'Farrell had a huge impact on the church him and his wife and his children um, and his family again have, have served um, significantly in the church and faithfully over a long period of time so he was a pioneer 
of the church in this island and help to forge a sense of strength, a sense of consistency, a sense of devotion. Um, and he's one of the ones that's very, very faithful and very true. And there are many others that I could name um, who have likewise been faithful to that cause. So beyond the lens, beyond Brother O'Farrell, there are others as well who have served faithfully and loyally. And in many ways, they have formed um, the, the core of the church. They have been the pioneering uh, stalwarts of the church who have led by example, who have served in church callings, who have shown the way, who have helped to develop the church into the kind of mature church it is now. And the church is still developing, it's still growing, but it has been greatly blessed um, because of the faithfulness of these early brethren and sisters. The top picture there is actually 1969 when Brother O'Farrell was baptized, as you can see, baptized in the ocean. And that wouldn't be unusual, uh, certainly back then, before we really had chapels. And even today, I live in the Midlands of Ireland, in the, the land where there's many lakes and many of our members are baptized in lakes even in cold months of the year and um, so it, these are the principles these are the practices these are the memories that we share as part of church history and we often think of church history as a global thing or perhaps as a, as an american thing and that's very important but it is important to recognize that we have a church history in each of our individual lands, in our communities, in our wards, in our branches, in our stakes, in our districts, in our missions. We have a history. We have a church history. And it's important to reflect um, and to remember on, on those things. Let me move on to my, my next slide. Um, in 1985, we had a very special experience happen on the island, and that was the coming of Elder Neil A. Maxwell of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He came to Loch Brickland, Northern Ireland, and he dedicated Ireland for the preaching of the gospel, both north and south, the entire island. Now, the land had been, it been included in dedicatory prayers prior to this, but this was a new prayer. Uh, by it by an apostle and we know after that we after his prayer his magnificent dedicatory prayer um which is a beautiful document and a beautiful prayer and i always encourage people to get a copy of it and to read it and to reflect on it the prophetic promises the powerful predictions the sense of blessing the sense of destiny that elder maxwell spoke to that would help the members of the church to realize um, that there is a sense of manifest destiny that there was a sense in which the lord was guiding his people that the church needed to be more firmly established that the church needed to be built on a rock solid foundation of faithful families of service of missionary service of temple service of living the gospel in our own homes and so I think it's a really watershed moment. It's, it's a really significant moment, that dedicatory prayer, which in many ways forged the path for new development of the church. In fact, the, um, the Dublin Ireland stake was formed in 1995, uh, just 10 years after Elder Maxwell gave his dedicatory prayer. And to some of us, that seemed like an absolute miracle we didn't have the numbers required for statehood, but the Lord in his mercy blessed us that a stake could come forth. In actual fact, I was um, at a leadership meeting when um, I was serving leadership after my mission and we went to a leadership meeting with the district presidency and the mission president. And the mission president um, shared some wonderful news with us. He said he was driving along in his car and his phone rang, his car phone, and he answered the phone and it was Elder James E. Faust of the Quorum of the Twelve. And Elder Faust said to um, the president at the time um, that he should pull over. This was President Jensen, Stephen Jensen at the time. They should pull over because he had some news for him. And he then proceeded to tell him that the brethren had given permission for the Dublin Ireland stake to be organized and that Elder Faust will be coming to organize the stake shortly. 
I think this was in, in February. Um, this was in February of 1995, I think. And so, yeah, that, that meeting was, and then the stake was organized a month later in March. It was around that time. We learned subsequently that what had happened was um, Elder Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve had been at a meeting with President Hinckley in which stakehood was discussed for Dublin and the numbers were looked at and it was evident that we didn't have sufficient numbers to form a stake. And President Hinckley reviewed the numbers, but then he, he turned to Elder Ballard and said, Elder Ballard, would the creation of a stake in Dublin bless the lives of the members? And Elder Ballard responded in the affirmative that such would be a great blessing. So President Hinckley, who was on the first presidency at the time, um, gave his approval for stakehood. Um, and so interestingly enough, uh, when Elder Faust was supposed to come over to form the stake, what actually happened was President Howard W. Hunter, who was the president of, of the church, died. And so all the apostles were immediately called back to Salt Lake City. Um, and then President Hinckley became the president of the church. In fact, as I recall, that was the same day that the stake was formed. So we had um, a member of the 70 come, Elder Graham Doxey came and organized the stake instead of Elder Faust. And so the stake went ahead and the calling of President Hinckley as the prophet of the church went ahead the same day. And I was amazed later on that year, President Hinckley came to Ireland and I'll speak about that in a couple of minutes, but how blessed we were to receive that stake. We who had thought about it, who had prayed about it, who had longed for it, who had worked for it, who thought it might never happen. Um, we had prayed and served and searched and hoped. And we found that the Lord blessed us with the creation of a stake. How marvelous, how wonderful, how richly blessed we felt. So it all traces back in many ways to the um, Elder Maxwell coming to dedicate the land and the, the level of peace that has happened in, in this land since his dedicatory prayer, which allowed the gospel to go forward. And again, that goes back to Elder John Taylor being at that very same spot more than 100 years earlier to baptize the first person on this island. So these things have a sense of history to them. Let me move on then to talk briefly about President Hinckley. In 1995, only six months or so after he was ordained president of the church, he came to speak in Dublin, in the Royal Dublin Society, and he invited all adult members of the church to come to that meeting. It was a meeting for members from the Belfast stake, from the Dublin stake, and from the, the Limerick district of the church. And so members came from all all across the island, many traveling for many hours to get there. And we all came to the Royal Dublin Society and we heard President Hinckley and his wife and other leaders share marvelous messages with us. And that was a watershed moment. That was the first time, as I'm aware, that a, an, an actual president of the church came to speak um, on the Emerald Isle at a time where all the members adult members throughout the island were invited to come together as one to hear a prophet speak. And what a marvelous occasion that was to all who were there, who felt the spirit and the power and the testimony of that man's witness of Christ, to hear his prophetic words, to hear his counsel, his guidance, to, to feel the sense of priesthood keys that he held and exercised all the priesthood keys it was a marvelous thing a marvelous meeting never ever to be forgotten his witness of the son of god and and the the power and purity we felt from him and his wife as they spoke to us how blessed we were to have that event and i was greatly privileged to be there at that event again another pivotal moment for the church on this island and as i've said the dublin ireland stake was organized in 1995 you can see a picture of the stake center there on the screen. Church membership in Ireland surpassed 3,000 in 2012. Um, and of course, the growth has been slow. There have been many barriers, many obstacles, many difficulties, many setbacks, persecution, um, disappointment, opposition, 
um, setbacks in lots of ways, but the church has continued to go forward. Um, and we now have a situation where in the Dublin stake, we have five wards and three branches. There are five branches in the Limerick district. And we actually have a, a lot of members fr from Ireland, but we also have members from places like Brazil, from Africa, places like Nigeria, from Eastern Europe, from China, from the United States, from South Africa, um, indeed from all over the world, it seems. We, ha we have people who have come, who have either joined the church here or had joined the church in their own homelands and then came here. So we have a real gathering of the church in this island. When Elder Quinton Cook came here last year, he was surprised at the diversity of the church in Ireland. He, he didn't realize that there are so many nations represented um, in the church on this island. So how blessed we are to have the church grow in difficult circumstances. Many missionaries um, and members over a long period of time served to make these things happen, to make this growth um, appear and through many trials and troubles and tears. And I'm grateful for their persistence. I'm grateful for their faith. I'm grateful for their devotion uh, to allow the kingdom of God to go forth on this island. Here we have a picture of between 1990 to 2023. So the last 30 years where members and leaders of the church have met with dignitaries, uh, leaders, um, political leaders and others. Uh, and so you can see there are a number of the, the brothers that are there. One of the brothers is um, the brother O'Farrell, who I mentioned earlier, who served as our uh, patriarch for many years before he's he passed away a couple of years ago. And we also have our mission presidents and we have um, brother Tom Bullman, who was a district president in the, the Cork district, now the Limerick district. Um, um, we have others there as well who served. In fact, my wife is pictured in the very uh, last picture there when she served as the Stake Relief Society president in the Dublin Ireland Stake up to a couple of years ago. And she met with many, um, it was an interfaith meeting where she met with political leaders and religious leaders from across the land. So, and that's just a flavor of some of the meetings we've had um, over the years. Um, with between the church and interfaith groups and between political and economic leaders. So the church has started to come out of obscurity in many ways. I shouldn't say start because it's been happening for some years, of 30 years, but it's continually, continually coming out of obscurity um, to bless the lives of the people. So that people become more aware of what the church is and what the church can do and the blessings and the benefits and the opportunities that come from this church and the privileges of this church um, and the, the, the great faith and faithfulness of many of the members and the missionaries and the leaders of this great church. And then um, those pictures there, the top picture is the Clendalkin Chapel in Dublin and the, the bottom picture is the Clancilla Chapel in, uh, Chapel in Dublin. So in 2022, there were nearly 4,000 members of the church in the Republic of Ireland, consisting of five wards and eight branches. And there are three family history um, search, family search centers, family history centers. Um, so what growth has happened? And again, many people have emigrated. Many people have um, joined the church and, and gone to other places. So it's been hard to build up the strength and the cohort of the church, but we've also been blessed by people staying in this island and we've been blessed by many people coming in from other places, which has been a great source of strength to the church. And there you'll see pictured across are the Limerick uh, Ireland Chapel uh, on the top and then beneath is the Cork Chapel. So they're part of the Limerick Ireland district. And again, we're grateful that there are chapels on this island. We're grateful that there are buildings for the saints to meet, for the saints to gather, to have that freedom of religion, 
freedom of conscience, to worship according to the dictates of their conscience, to accept the Prophet Joseph Smith, to accept the Book of Mormon, to accept the restored priesthood, to accept additional scripture, to accept the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as the Lord's uh, true and living church on the face of the earth. Now, Northern Ireland, let me speak about Northern Ireland because it wouldn't be appropriate if I were not to reflect the fact that the church has been established in Northern Ireland for a long time. In many ways, the church is more mature in Northern Ireland, being around for longer than it is in Southern Ireland. Uh, there are some nine wards and branches in the Belfast Northern Ireland stake. The stake was created originally in 1974 and has at present over 5,000 members. So it's a very significantly sized stake. It was actually formed by um, President Ezra Taft Benson um, back uh, many years ago when he was um, in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and he came to form this stake. The stake has three family history centers and I've included a picture of the Belfast Stake Center, which is in Belfast City. And the, the church in, in Belfast in Northern Ireland has a strong history, a strong legacy. We've many members and saints and people there who've served as missionaries across the world. In fact, we've also had a number of brethren there who have served on temple presidencies and on mission presidencies. Um, Brother Raymond Lowry, who served as the mission president in Birmingham and as, as temple president in London. We have Brother Peter Ferguson, who served on the temple presidency of the Preston England Temple. We also had um, Brother McCrudden, James McCrudden, who serves as the current president of the um, Scotland Ireland mission, and he comes from the Belfast Stake, having previously served as stake president there. And we have many others. I can't name everyone, obviously, but there are many members, male and female, young and old, who have served faithfully in Northern Ireland uh, to bring the church out of obscurity to share the gospel across the world. And how grateful I, I, I am for that. Um, I will say actually that um, it, it's a great privilege. I was able to attend youth conference in Northern Ireland many years ago, my first youth conference when I was 14 years of age and I went to Belfast um, and to experience the strength and the size of the church there was a great boon to me. It was a great encouragement to see how well developed the church was there. And so I had Brother John Conley and his, his wife Eileen. Um, as I include in all the people I've named and all the people I haven't named, husbands and wives who have served faithfully in the church um, as, as leaders, quietly in the background or in the forefront. Um, they've served, they've done what they were asked to do, and I'm grateful for all of them. I do want to mention Brother John Connolly Sr. and his wife Eileen, who serve, um, he serves as the patriarch of the Dublin Ireland stake. He was originally born in Northern Ireland, and um, he and his good wife served uh, as uh, on the presidency of the uh, Preston Temple, him serving on the presidency and his wife serving as an assistant to the matron. And um, they actually, John was born in Northern Ireland. So um, they have six children and all of their children are active in the church and have done a huge work for the Lord on this island and in other places they've been in. And there are many others I could name um, as part of church history. This is just a brief interview to talk, just, the, just a brief interview. When I say interview, I mean this is just a brief recording to talk about um, the history of the church on this island, to talk about some of the things that have happened um, and some of the great experiences. I mentioned John Connolly because he was actually at um, Lock Brickland in 1985 when Elder Maxwell came to dedicate the land for the preaching of the gospel. 
Um, I believe he was serving as the district president in the Dublin Ireland district at the time and he has great experiences to share the feelings and the thoughts and the recollections of what it was like at that time. So I want to bring this all together and say that this has been a long gradual steady development of the church and um, there have been many wonderful spectacular moments but there have also been many small moments many quiet moments many reflective and thoughtful experiences there's been much opposition there's been much, many setbacks there has been a lot of faithful uh, service hard work slog discipline and consistency there's also been temptations and trials there's people who have struggled um, to continue to keep going who found it hard and that's part of our legacy as well it's all part of our legacy uh, that the restored church has faced not only in this island but throughout the world and it is part of our history it's part of our faith it's part of our our testimony that these things take time they take effort they take work and they take a sense of legacy a sense of faith a sense of um, understanding that these things take process of time they're a developmental process they don't happen overnight the church takes time to mature and to develop and to grow uh, the future of the church in Ireland is bright as we continue to build on the legacy of faith we have inherited many people have hoped and looked forward to the day when we get a temple on this emerald isle at the moment our members attend the temple either in Preston or in London and when the new temple becomes comes to Birmingham uh, in the next couple of years we'll probably go there as well and other places too but the time will come of course when the Lord determines to build a temple on this island and hopefully it won't be too far distant but that temple is something to look forward to it's a house of the Lord and we would love to be ready as a people to have a temple built on this island on this this land of saints and scholars or what i call this land of restored saints and scholars this is a great work this is the work of almighty god this is the work of prophets and apostles it's the work of angels it's the work of god it's the work of men and women and children it's the work of missionaries and leaders and servants of men as they labor in the offices of the priesthood as women as they labor in service in teaching in leading in blessing it's the work of a lifetime it's the work of conversion it's the work of heart mind and spirit and body it's the work of the scriptures it's the work of serving in the temple of serving in the mission fields of serving in the wards and branches and the stakes and the districts this is the work of a lifetime this is God's almighty work revealed in these last days it's not always easy it's rarely if ever convenient but it is a great work it's a marvelous work and a wonder as spoken of by Isaiah the prophet Joseph Smith has taught us brethren go forward courage and on on to the victory go forward and not backward he has taught us and instructed us that this work will succeed that heaven will be victorious it's my faith and testimony that the emerald isle is an isle of promise it's an isle that's blessed because we have the restored gospel here we have covenants we have ordinances we have doctrines we have scriptures we have prophets and apostles we have uh, high priests and bishops and stake presidents and elders and sisters and teachers and deacons and priests we have missionaries um, both male and female and we have temple covenants and ordinances we have all the promises and the blessings of the Lord which he's given to his people how grateful I am for these marvelous things I testify that Jesus is the living Christ the almighty son of God he is the great Emmanuel the light and the life of the world I testify that Joseph Smith is the choice seer 
the prophet, seer and revelator of our day, of our time. Chosen, raised up, anointed to build God's kingdom on the earth. I testify that those in this island who've been raised up by God were prepared before the foundation of the world to do his work, to build his kingdom, to serve, to take upon themselves the name of Jesus Christ with purpose, with intentionality, with dedication. I testify that this is the restored church. It is a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful kingdom. And the work is small in Ireland, but it is true. The work is small, but it is powerful. The work is small, but it continues to grow. The church is a beacon. It's a light. We serve, we bless, we heal, we teach, we inspire, we contribute. We do so many things because of this church and kingdom. And I know that we have a role to play. We have a work to do, each one of us, in building up and sustaining and defending God's kingdom on the earth. It's my testimony that the Holy Ghost bears witness that these things are true. The Book of Mormon is the Word of God. The temple is the house of God. The priesthood is the priesthood of God. The gifts are the gifts of God. This church is true. It will fill the earth. And as we continue to be a beacon, as we continue to serve, as we continue to be faithful, this church will bless the lives, not only of each person that comes into contact with it, but all the families who are a part of it, and indeed the, the entire nations on this island. I love my Saviour Jesus Christ. I know that he lives. I am a witness that he lives. I am a witness that he is aware of us, that he loves us, that he is moving among the nations of the earth to restore his covenant people to the lands of their inheritance and to all the covenants and ordinances and promises of time and eternity. I witnessed that Christ suffered in Gethsemane. He was the suffering servant. He took upon himself the sins of the world so that we might be made clean. He took upon himself death so that we might be born again to a resurrection of new life. I know that he lives. I have a witness that he lives. And I'm so grateful that because of this church, because of this restored gospel, because of the prophet Joseph and the Book of Mormon, and the priesthood and the, the miracles of the gospel, and because of all the missionaries that have served here and all the leaders, that my testimony has become rock solid in these things. I know these things are true with all my heart, might, mind and strength. I bear testimony of our Father in heaven. He lives. He is our loving, generous, kind God. He is our perfect Father. He is our merciful leader. He has prepared a plan for our salvation, our redemption, our joy, our exaltation. And I know that as we look to our history, and as we look to our present, and as we look to our future, and as we understand these things, these spiritually significant things, historically and spiritually significant, that our lives will be transformed. I testify that these things are indeed true. I bear testimony that Russell M. Nelson is a prophet of the Lord, called, ordained, by the Lord to lead his church in these days and in these times. And I likewise bear testimony that those who are called to lead our missions and our stakes and our temples and our districts and our wards and our branches and our quorums and our groups and our classes are called by God, called of God to do his work. None of us can do this work alone. We are not reliant on our own strength. We have divine help. We have divine power. The power of God uh, will transform the world. Great things are coming. The Lord will soon come back to this earth to retain and claim his rights of leadership, to, to, to sit on his throne, to lead us, 
back to his heavenly kingdom. I bear testimony that these are times to be awake. These are times to be alert. These are times to be astute, to have our eyes and our hearts and our minds and our spirits open to God's marvelous word. I bear testimony that these things are true. I know that they are true. And I invite each of us to come to Christ and to come to know for ourselves that these things are true. How grateful I am for the opportunity to have been with you today. I pray that you will be blessed. I pray that you will come unto Christ humbly, sincerely, deeply, genuinely. Come and see, come and feel, come and learn. Investigate this church, learn about this church, examine, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. I know that these things have blessed my life richly. I do not regret being a member of the church. I love it. I rejoice in it. I sustain it wholeheartedly. I know that God is good and all that he does will bless us and strengthen us, comfort us, heal us, beautify us, bring us peace and bring us to everlasting salvation in the kingdom of God for time and all eternity. God bless you.